You're listening to a CNA podcast. Hey Siri, can you read out my events for the day? Today, you have three events. From 1600 hours to 1700 hours, you have meeting. Thanks Siri. Looks like a busy day ahead. Hi folks, how many of you have interacted with artificial intelligence today? Did you use Siri to pull up this podcast? AI has seeped into our everyday lives, so much so that we barely even think about it now. Malaysia, though, is thinking about it a lot. The country wants to be a regional leader, not only in AI, but also in tech. So what is it doing to get there? I'm Teresa Tang. CNA's Malaysia correspondents Afifa Arfin and Melissa Go join me this week. Ladies, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We heard Afifa interacting with Siri there, asking about plans for the day. How prevalent is AI in your lives? I think we use AI in almost every aspect of our daily lives, right? I think at this point in our lives, we just cannot escape it. I mean, from ChatGPT to using Siri to plan our day, it's just everywhere for me. I mean, predictive text or like when you're trying to do Google searches, all of these things are AI. Oh, yeah. Mel? No, I don't. But indirectly, yes, maybe. But I don't subscribe to any uh, AI tool or AI site. The Bureau uses AI tools to help us with the transcribing, especially long interviews. But apart from that, not really. I thought I don't use it that much. But Afifa, after hearing your list, I think I do use it, but I'm not really aware. Those self-driving cars, I have seen a few of those around our office and it makes me do a double take. I'm still kind of scared of those. Generally, Afifa, how much do Malaysians depend on AI nowadays, do you think? I think it's growing. I think almost everyone in Malaysia is using AI in some form or another. People on the street that we've spoken to have always tell us that like, you know, they use it in their daily lives at home or even when they go to work. A lot of the processes of work uses AI in some form. So I think it's quite pervasive in society. And I think that's why the Malaysian government is sort of putting a lot of focus and attention and commitment into this. When I talk to people, I ask, why do you think Malaysia is really driving this AI? A lot of the answers they tell me is because Anwar Ibrahim, you know, AI, that's why the agenda is there. <laughs> but generally, I think everyone around the world is using AI. So let's listen in to what some of the Malaysians on the streets uh, tell me about how they use AI daily. AI may take over the whole world and, and they'll be the rulers of us. And look at it, it's so perfect, they can do everything. That's my greatest fear. I think it's a good thing that to help us to be more effective, to help us to be more, you know, to take away job that people like humans don't really want to do. There'll be a big a positive and negative as well. But, you know, it is what it is. The future is heading that way. So I think either we adopt it, go with it or we'll be left behind. Mel, you've been looking at a different angle, and that is technology. Penang, it's on the northwest coast of peninsular Malaysia. It's known for its food. I love the chendol. I love the laksa there. Me too. Yeah, you too. But I didn't realize that it was once dubbed the Silicon Valley of the East. And you spent some time in that state. Did you get the sense of that reputation when you were there? Well, for starters, all the e-hailing grab apps, right, the grab car drivers that took mm -hmm. us around in Penang, if it's part-time, their day job somehow or rather, you know, be related to the semicon, the E&E &E sectors. Now, Bayan Lepas, the industrial zone and the uh, five kilometre radius and the neighbouring Kulim, the high-tech park there, seeing high of activities as the estate is now trying to, working with the federal government to move the semiconductor industry up the value chain. Well, not just, you know, in front-end chip manufacturing, but also in advanced testing, advanced packaging, and IC design. Now, the goal, according to the Penang Chief Minister, Chao Kuan Yao, uh, whom I spoke with in Penang, is to become the first South Asian country for Malaysia to boast an end-to-end, front-end supply chain. Now, Penang, he said, has done very well in the last 50 years. It's now home to some 350 MNCs. The country is the sixth largest exporter of semiconductors right now. But so far, it's been focusing a lot on back-end activities. So it needs to move up the value chain, the semiconductor as a whole, because Vietnam, Indonesia, India, they are all catching up. So Malaysia mm -hmm. just cannot stand still. 
and defend its position, it has to move up the value chain to ride the super AI-driven cycle. Now, the trade conflict between US and China has somehow presented a golden opportunity for the country to do so. Now, already seeing tech giants from US and Europe move their plant and also their production line here in Malaysia, because Malaysia is seen as a neutral, a more neutral country. Now, Penang is the biggest beneficiary because it's attracted billions of investment. The existing ecosystem is good and investor can just come in, pluck and play. But, you know, it has other challenges as well. Yeah, we're going to unpack that in a bit, but I want to make clear the link here. Semiconductors are key to artificial intelligence because AI servers, they need a lot of power, a lot of servers, and those semiconductors are in those servers, in the devices that we use. Afifa, in terms of AI applications we're familiar with, you know, we talk about digital assistants, chatbots. In Malaysia, what are some of the ways AI is being used that surprised you the most? I think for my episode, we went to look at the different types of AI there are in Malaysia and in what industries they're being used. And I wanted to show how AI is being used in our daily lives, in items that we don't realize that AI is in. So for example, when I went to this grocery store in Putrajaya, we saw how there was the use of AI in shopping carts, which basically enhances your overall shopping experience. So that was very interesting. We also got to see some driver car technology, which basically helps the driver to remain more alert on the roads. And so it makes driving more safe. And also getting to see how AI is being used in robotics. That was very interesting to be able to interact with these robots as if they were a real human. And it was very interesting because the level of technology that's being used in these robots is so remarkable. You know, they can detect my facial features, they can tell (laughs) how I'm feeling. One of the robots actually, you know, threw a couple of pickup lines at me and I was like, oh, (laughs) blushing a little bit. So I thought these were all very, you know, useful. Well, not Useful, yes, but also very novel ideas that makes it very interesting. But at the end of the day, all of these uses for AI in whatever applications, the eventual goal is to drive productivity and in some form to help the economy and boost the economy. I mean, the plan for Malaysia is that they see AI being able to boost the GDP by almost 30% in the next decade. Wow. Yeah, I wonder what your husband thought when you told him, I was hit on by a robot today at work. (laughs) You you talk about the investment. Okay, so Microsoft, it's looking to Malaysia with a lot of optimism. The company has poured more than $2 billion, with a B, $2 billion into the country. And you wanted to know very simply, what makes Malaysia so attractive? So what did Microsoft tell you? So I spoke to the new country manager in Microsoft's online immersive space where He and I were both avatars and we were able to walk around a virtual room. So that was quite cool. What he was saying is that Malaysia essentially has the necessary ingredients. He has the right foundation to build the AI space, which is why Microsoft has decided to pump in billions into this space. But let's listen more from him, Lauren C., the Managing Director for Microsoft Malaysia. So we are very bullish about Malaysia, the progressive policies by the government, uh, especially the national digital uh, blueprint and also the uh, AI roadmap. And that really drives the growth that we are seeing today. The other thing that we are seeing is that uh, the adoption is not just driven by the Gen Z, but it's really across all the different uh, the generations as well, from millennials to boomers. And I think... At the end of the day, Malaysia is unlike any other country. It's trying to get its footing, grappling with understanding this AI boom that has taken over the world by storm over the last couple of years. And at the heart of the government's approach to this AI strategy is really to look at the bigger picture of how to digitalize the economy. So it's more of a focus on the digital economy conversation. And AI is one of the main drivers of that discussion. So let's listen in to Malaysia's Digital Minister, Gobin Singh. It's um, a clear signal that uh, there is confidence, uh, not just uh, regionally, but also globally in Malaysia, uh, its government. And I think uh, that confidence um, has uh, resulted in us uh, seeing these investments. Now, having said that, um, we must also recognize the fact that uh, we are strategically placed, uh, ASEAN, Uh, to me, uh, is uh, an economic powerhouse. Mel, Malaysia is attracting a large number of big tech names. Billions of dollars have come in. But the number one challenge that you found is finding and retaining talent to fill all these jobs. 
our crew, we traveled from Penang, Selangor, and down south to Johor. So we took a look at the challenges facing the tech industry. Now, a common thread that runs through states is that they compete to be tech hub, yes, on one hand, and but they're also competing for talent. The concern is creating the talent pipeline, and that's the biggest challenge the industry is facing right now, from wafer fab to IC design to data centers. Finding the right talent in chip making is a problem, and also the culture and the work ethics in chip making in IC design, especially, is very different. It's super grueling, and just being hardworking alone is not enough. IC designers they must be prepared to put in the long hours. It takes creativity. Innovation and grit to come up with IC solution for AI. They are different breed altogether. IC designers. I met a few of them. They work as a pack, a wolf pack. Some said. Now <laughs> let's hear it from the industry veteran here. Uh, he's been working in Japan for over 20 years, and now he's working for a Taiwanese tech giant. Uh, his name is Adlan Jisman. Quite a character, I must say. He's the founder and CEO of Virtual Reality Solutions. In Taiwan, if you In TSMC, for example, you have a three shift. Mm. When you wanted to do the the chip, they have a three shift around the clock. Yeah. Around the clock, it never stops. Yeah. It never stops. Okay, try to do it here in Malaysia. You will get a lot, a lot of what we call like work-life balance. This is crazy of um, you making people working non-stop. A lot of this, you see, a lot of complaints. In your report, Mal, you found that Malaysia produces about 5,000 engineering graduates a year, but 50,000 are needed. That's a huge shortfall. What's being done to encourage more to take up this field to stay in Malaysia? I know you talked to some students, right? Yep. The pay for engineering fresh grads is relatively low, about 1,000 US dollars. Now, and the course is long, and it's four years, and it's tough. It's not easy, and many just felt that the so-called ROI, the return on investment, just isn't there. Now, while mm. some students they drop out because they just couldn't get into the university that they want, and private university is just too expensive and it's not an option. And this decades-old、uh, quota system favoring certain race. Also not helping, and lately it's been reported that the number of students pursuing STEM subjects—science, technology, engineering, mathematics—is dwindling. So all this doesn't all go well as Malaysia is trying to grow its、uh, talent pipeline. Now I spoke with Minister of Economy Rafizi Ramli, and he said that he hopes to introduce a dual system, a supply-driven one and a demand-driven one,、uh, talent pipeline system where people can just go directly into the industry、uh, that they like, and they get certified eventually and get their diploma or get their degree. Now the target is to create 60,000 engineers in five years in order for this national semiconductor strategy to take off. Now MNC. Are also doing their part, chipping in, creating their own talent pool, but poaching is common, so that is also a worry on their part. Like poaching from international organizations, companies. Yes,、yeah. and they are contributing to the ecosystem. They said they are not worried. Some of the big guys、mm. like Intel and Infineon, they have trained so many and they have lost so many, but they will、yeah. continue to grow. If we look at the bigger picture, you know, like you mentioned earlier, geopolitics also very much at play. We've seen the headlines about the U.S.-China chip war, and you found that that tension, Mel, it means a country like Malaysia can really stand to benefit. Yes,、uh, while Malaysia is、uh, extremely vulnerable, it's so trade reliant. If tension were to escalate between the two superpowers, now China is Malaysia's largest trading partner. We all know that, and U.S. is the largest investor. Now, although increasingly U.S. Europe they are buying a lot more, investing more in Malaysia. Now, FDI in the first six months, it's about 40 billion U.S. dollars, and a large part goes to the tech sector. Now, Malaysia is trying to seize this window of opportunity that's opened up to penetrate into. Market that once dominated by just a few players, and it wants to make its own AI chip eventually, and has its own IPs and end-to-end -end product line, and well, the product itself at the end of the day. Although that dream is still a long way off, the market it sees. We are starting to see some local champions here as well. One of them is Skychip. It's a four-year-old startup that's eyeing for listing、uh, next year. I spoke to its founder, Mr. Feng Sui Kiang. He's the CEO of Skychip, and he has a lot to say. Due to the geopolitical、uh, situations, we can see that semiconductor is no longer a global industry. It's actually、uh, is going through a deglobalization、uh, phases. So when when the market get fragmented, so called,、right, it open up opportunities for new players. The segmentization of the semiconductor industry, customer are all 
are more open to uh, other solutions, right, from a more neutral country like Malaysia. Right? I think that earns us the window to offer our IP solutions. This all sounds really exciting. You know, Afifa, there's a vision, there's optimism, there's money. It sounds like all the right ingredients for success. So how different is Malaysia going to look a decade from now, two decades from now? Will it be a leader in the digital economy? I think Malaysia could look very different in a decade or two, but that really depends on how fast they are able to pounce on this opportunity, right? Time is of the essence in this new world of data and technology, and Malaysia really needs to act now. When I was talking to the digital minister, Gobind Singh, one of the things he said was there were a lot of complaints about too much bureaucracy resulting in applications or approvals taking time. And unfortunately, when that happens, a lot of opportunities opportunities are lost because investors mm-hmm. would just look elsewhere. And you need to accept that each country in this game is really trying their best to attract investment. So if you mm-hmm. fall behind and if Malaysia lets bureaucracy gets into the way of how they operate, then they are at risk of losing those investments to all of the nations around you. And if you look at Southeast Asia, there's a lot of competition coming from within the region itself. Well, I think the verdict is still out, whether Malaysia can break into front-end IC design and create its own uh, front-end supply chain. Given that it's a very close industry and dominated by a few giants, uh, I asked Malaysia Economy Minister Rafizi Bramli, what if Malaysia misses this window? You know, he said that it will take a lot harder and longer to jump higher. Now, having said that, there are many structural issues. He said that he needs to fix the ministry, the agencies overlapping, the turf war, uh, the race-based policy. That's why he said, I quote him, our biggest enemy is ourselves, he said. And if you do not adopt positivity, this can-do attitude and work as a nation, you know, it needs a whole of the nation, you know, whole society approach for it to succeed. Yeah, there's this sort of AI mania everywhere you look. And it's exciting to think about Malaysia and what political will and investment there can achieve. Thank you both, ladies. Thank you, Teresa. Pleasure. A reminder that the TV episodes of CNA Correspondent air every Wednesday at 9.30pm Singapore Hong Kong time and you can find Mel's and Afifa's reports on YouTube as well as on CNA.Asia. The team behind this week's episode is Saya Wynn, Clara Ong, Crispina Robert, Craig Dale and myself, Teresa Tang. Join us again next week. Bye for now.